It's the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Mike McIntyre. Thanks for joining us. Protests over the Israel-Hamas war have come to institutions of higher education in Ohio and across the nation. Administrators struggle to balance free speech rights with campus and student safety. Yesterday, Case Western Reserve University, which had been tolerating an encampment on campus, declared protesters to be criminally tras- trespassing. No action was taken. They're still there. And as some call for the National Guard, there are echoes of 1970 on the campus of Kent State University. The anniversary of the May 4th shooting that left four students dead is tomorrow, and a commemoration is planned. The Browns want the public to cover half the cost of a new or renovated stadium. If they stay on the lakefront, a massive billion-dollar renovation. If they build a dome in Brook Park, the tab would be north of $2 billion. Half of either is a lot. The civil rights lawyer who represented George Floyd's family is now advocating for the family of an East Canton man who died in the custody of Canton police last month. The incident has led to calls for police reform and a federal investigation. A state lawmaker wants to raise the Ohio minimum wage to $15 an hour. And litter bugs are throwing tax dollars out of their car windows. The Ohio Department of Transportation says cleanup costs $10 million a year. Joining me for the roundtable from IdeaStream Public Media, education reporter Connor Morris and health reporter Taylor Wisner. Good to have both of you here. Happy to be here. Glad to be here, yeah. And Connor particularly, education reporter. Lately it's been protest reporter. I know you were on the campus of Case most of the week and appreciate all the extra hours. Yeah, before it it was budget reporter. Now it's (laughs) (laughs) protest reporter. It's always something. Sometime we're actually going to talk about education, right? (laughs) In Columbus, we have State House News Bureau Chief Karen Kassler, who covers everything, too. Good to have you there, Karen. Hey, good morning. Good morning. We don't take calls on the roundtable, but we do want to have your thoughts shared during the show. So send me an email, soi at ideastream.org. I've got my phone. I can work the comments or questions into our conversation. You can also tweet at Sound of Ideas. All right, let's get ready to roundtable. Pro-Palestinian protesters demanding divestment in Israel have set up encampments on college campuses here, across the state, and across the nation. It's forcing administrators to grapple with that balance of protecting the right of peaceful demonstration and then assuring campus safety. In Cleveland, pro-Palestinian protesters set up the encampment at Case Western Reserve University earlier this week. The school originally tolerated their presence on private property, declaring that enrolled students could stay overnight in tents. But yesterday, the university declared protesters, some of whom are not students, were trespassing. The school said protesters did not abide by the requirement that only students remain overnight. Also, a counter-protest of Israeli supporters began there yesterday. Police were present last night, did not take action. We're monitoring that today. Protests occurred on other campuses, including Oberlin College and Ohio State University, where students there peacefully dispersed Wednesday after multiple arrests last week. President Joe Biden spoke to the nation briefly Thursday morning to reiterate the right of students to peacefully protest. He also reminded students and protesters who aren't students that vandalism, trespassing, and violence were not protected. Calls by some, like House Speaker Mike Johnson, for Biden to bring in the National Guard has awakened memories of May 4th, 1970 at Kent State University, anniversary of that tragic weekend and deadly day being tomorrow. Connor, as I mentioned, you've been on the campus another long evening, uh, long night yesterday. Uh, and thank you and Egal Kaufman as well, who's been there. Uh, where do we currently stand? Yeah, you know, as you mentioned, the university says that anybody trespass or protesting on the oval there, you know, by the library, uh, Case Western Reserve is uh, trespassing and could be charged through their university disciplinary process for students, but also could be charged criminally. Uh, that didn't stop the protesters, though. They were they were camped out there through the night. Uh, they went uh, they marched to the administrative offices and, and posted their demands on the, the front door of the of the building. Uh, you know, they they also had, you know, there was food, there, there the tents there still, they were dancing, they were singing, playing drums. Uh, you know, that continued into the night, as I mentioned. So I went there a couple of nights ago. It was a very small encampment in front of the Kelvin Smith Library on the grass there. As I understand it, they expanded that last night a little bit. They, yeah, they were pushing it a little bit. They moved, uh, the the university had some barriers they set up and they moved them out onto the sidewalk. They being the, the protesters. The protesters, yes. And from my experience of covering protests, you know, that's something that uh, administrations typically, you know, any kind of blocking of ingress or egress into buildings or blocking of, of public thoroughfares, that's uh, usually a no-go. And But they, they were not arrested, though. And I know at Ohio State they have had they had encampments and people were um, hauled off last week. Now what's happening there is they aren't tent 
cities types of things yeah. where people are just showing up to protest. Yes, exactly. And typically they're dispersing, you know, towards the, the, the you know, maybe like 9 p.m. or so time period, uh, voluntarily dispersing um, for, for the most part from what we understand. But what I'm seeing on television is UCLA, University of California, Los Angeles. We're seeing that. We're seeing Columbia, yeah. where it is much more chaotic. Yes, Uh the you know in Colombia we saw students that went to take over a building and there is some history of that in in college campus protests and the history of protests in general occupying buildings uh, so it's not without precedent of course but yeah police were were sent in to clear that building um, I believe yesterday or two days ago uh, and you know and at US, UCLA what we're seeing really is uh, a pretty significant counter protest movement as well and actually the counter protesters I mean there's reports of them macing folks uh, you know and so there are more serious clashes between the two there we haven't really seen that in Ohio that I know of so far really uh, you know the counter protesters uh, that were out at case uh, last night uh, there were just a, a, a you know maybe six or seven or so and uh, you know there was there was dialogue happening too as well uh, there were arguments yes he did arguments, but, you know, no fights whatsoever. So obviously this all uh, relates to uh, the war uh, with Hamas and what the Palestinian protesters, pro-Palestinian protesters are saying is, you know, get out of Gaza and, uh, you know, all of that. Uh, The Israeli uh, protesters are saying, listen, you're saying from the river to the sea, that means you want us to not exist. That's the age old argument that's going on for decades. But what we're hearing from the protesters is one specific demand, and that is divest. Yeah, there was there's a uh, at case there are there's like six demands. Um, You know, uh, that's one of the big ones, though, you know, uh, disclosure close what cases investments are and then uh, you know divest from any kind of companies that are, are profiting off of the war so to speak but there's also a broader anti-war movement that's been missed a little bit with some of these protests a lot of these students are calling for divesting from military contractors in general so not just uh, related to Israel so that's been kind of interesting to hear that from the students uh, also at case they're they're calling on the university to cut academic ties with Israeli institutions as well. So it, it makes a, it's, it's a little bit of different form for each protest, but we're seeing similar demands in Oberlin, for example, as well, where there's been an encampment this week, too. So, Karen, we mentioned Ohio State. The president there approached the protest last week with what some viewed as a pretty heavy hand. Uh, there were police on rooftops. Um, tell me a little bit about that and whether that has changed uh, in a week. Well, I think uh, there's a lot of pressure on college presidents to keep the peace but allow students the right to free speech and like you said some people are under the um, opinion that some of these colleges have gone too far have brought in police Uh, these are students who are largely peaceful protesters and at Ohio State we have not seen anything like Columbia where buildings have been broken into though Ohio State did order buildings locked in anticipation of protests the protests last week uh, it really went fairly peaceful up until about 10 o'clock at night when police forces started moving in and the protesters started performing an evening prayer and all of that really clashed as you had protester demonstrators surrounding those who were praying and so and of course a lot of this uh, un, uh, unfolded on live television too so th- th- I think that there's a, a lot of pressure to try to keep the peace and and follow the laws but also to allow students the opportunity to protest while students are there because we're getting to the end of the school year so I think that there's the hope that this will diffuse as students leave to go home for summer you've mentioned the word students a number of times there and what mm-hmm. I What I'm hearing from uh, college administrators here and and in an interview uh, on NPR that I heard with Eric Adams from uh, New York City, the mayor there, was the idea that many of these protesters are not students in New York at Columbia and uh, uh, at Columbia. uh, They said that uh, it was 40 percent as high as that. I don't know how they got that number, but a number of people who aren't students. And that's been um, one of the bigger issues. You wonder if after the school year. Uh, those who aren't students will persist. Well, and of the students of the 40... 
uh, I, I can't remember, it was 41, I think, who were arrested last week. M- m- a certain number, like 16 of them were students, and I mean, 46 arrested. 16 were students and uh, or faculty members, people affiliated with Ohio State, and then the rest weren't. So, mm. m- but that doesn't necessarily indicate, just because that's what the arrest breakdown was, that doesn't indicate what the population of those who were demonstrating was. I, I think that's a narrative that you're hearing a lot. And certainly there are people, I mean, colleges have been a place where people have come out to demonstrate. I mean, there's a history going back, and we're going to remember it uh, tomorrow with Kent State and the anniversary of the May 4th shootings in 1970. College campuses have been a place of demonstration and protest for decades now. And so it does, they do tend to bring out other people. The question is, of course, and this is the narrative that that people are being bussed in from other places or, or paid to do that. And I don't know that there's evidence of that. Karen mentioned Kent State, and I talked about it earlier too, Connor. The the thing that's really um, unsettling, I think, to people is when we hear folks saying they ought to call in the National Guard, and anybody who knows anything about Kent State would get a chilling effect from that, given what happened where the National Guard opened fire on innocent, unarmed students. Um, the echoes are cer- certainly striking now. Yeah, we spoke with some uh, faculty members and students this week about that, and they were all saying, uh, hold up, you know, sending in the National Guard is probably not the best I- idea, you know, in response to uh, students that are peacefully protesting, given the history. Uh, and, and it's kind of been, I guess, burned into our cultural consciousness for, for many of us. I mean, I'm, I'm only 32, of course, but still, I mean, I grew up understanding that context, you know, I you know, grew up in Ohio, of course, so maybe not everyone, I guess, but still, uh, you know, I think the idea there is you don't want that to happen, right? And with all the protests across the country so far, there have not been any students that have been killed uh, or, or demonstrators that have been killed. Um, there have been relatively uh, tough takedowns of students that we've seen in Texas. We've seen rubber bullets being deployed uh, in, in, in other college campuses as well. Again, none of that here, but still, uh, you know, some of the students that I talked to at, at Kent were saying, look, we're, we're seeing, even without the National Guard being called, and we are seeing students being, you know, their words brutalized by police in some regard, uh, uh, unnecessarily so, you know, who, students who are trying to express themselves. But again, you know, it, it's tough when universities are trying to manage uh, you know, the operations of, you know, they're trying to maintain the normal operations at the university. Uh, we've heard about graduation, you know, ceremony or, or one or two being canceled uh, due to these protests. So they're trying to balance things. And it's, it all comes back to that sort of time, manner, place thing. You know, wh- wh- where is it appropriate for a protest to happen, you know, and is it inter- disrupting university operations? So uh, as Karen yep. mentioned, these administrations are in a tough spot sometimes. Got a question from Heather. She says, this is graduation week at Ohio State. Any inter- Interference from the protesters, and I assume that would be also a question about Case Western Reserve University. How much are administrators worrying about that, and how much do protesters plan to interfere in any way with those ceremonies? Yeah, I haven't heard any news about them tr- wanting to interfere at all with the, these ceremonies. Uh, a number of the protesters that I talked to actually recently, Case, are seniors, actually, including one of the protest organizers. So uh, I think they want to graduate, you know. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, Karen, I don't know if you've heard anything about uh, OSU's uh, uh, commencement or not. I, I have not heard anything. I think obviously the goal is to not have this disrupt or in any way be a problem. I mean, the last I'd heard was that commencement will go on as scheduled. Uh, the question would be for some of those who have demonstrating, are they going to demonstrate in any way? And one of the things that I've heard brought up a couple of times too here is, you know, four years ago, these, these kids who are graduating now missed a graduation because of COVID. And so this is really a, a meaningful, potentially meaningful commencement yeah. and so you know you don't want you never want to see commencement uh put put off unless I, I mean students have the right to attend it or not attend it some students choose to skip their own commencement but you know <laughs> it, it, it's a great opportunity to yeah. celebrate uh, accomplishments and you're saying four years ago they missed their high school uh graduation right, exactly by the way my son did skip his ohio state commencement because <laughs> it was it was on zoom and uh, my wife and i watched it as he uh, slept <laughs> oh. <laughs> because i'm not getting up for that he said um let's uh uh, let's, uh, Connor, I know you'll be monitoring that all day today. Yep. And again, appreciate you being on that wall. Of course. Uh, the Cleveland Browns want the public to foot half the bill for either a renovated stadium on the lakefront in Cleveland, public tab $500 million, 
or more, and a new do- or a new dome stadium in Brook Park. The cost to the public would be maybe around $1.2 billion. The Browns lobbied state officials this week, kept the plans close to their chest pads, not allowing copies to be kept. The funding would come from state, county, and local governments by way of taxpayers. Karen, Browns, as I mentioned, met with state lawmakers. They didn't specifically ask for money, but they just wanted to let them know what they're thinking. Well, and I'm going to be talking to the finance, House Finance Chair, Jay Edwards, about this in a couple of hours here today. But as, as I understand it, he sat down with some of the uh, folks from the Browns to look at renderings and to talk about what, what it might look like. But, I, I mean, I'm old enough to remember Browns fans saying they didn't want a dump stadium. So I, I think that this is really interesting <laughs> to hear the talk of let's bring a dome stadium to Cleveland. And, and certainly for a lot of taxpayers, this is a huge bill to pay. Yeah, not commenting on whether or not people should be in favor of public funding or anything else, but Amy Eddings asked me today in our chat whether I thought a dome stadium would be better, and I said I don't care if it has a lid or not. I actually do care. I don't want a dome stadium, and this is from (laughs) the beginning of time. I'm old enough to have made this argument back when we were talking about this 30-something years ago. I don't even think there should be seats in a football stadium. (laughs) I think it should be a giant ringed a, a auditorium, uh, <laughs> and we should all be standing there. What happened? You stand the entire game anyway, if it's any good. Uh, I suppose you want to make sure there's plenty of beverages, and that's about it. That's the only amenity you need. I, I, no sweets. I know I'm never going to get invited to a suite now after I said that. <laughs> but football should not be a cushy sport. I know I'm in the minority. Uh, House Finance Committee Chair Jay Edwards, you said you're going to talk to him today um, about the money. Um, Let's talk about that in general. The state has gone to bat for Ohio sports owners in the past. Cleveland isn't the only city with professional sports teams and stadiums. So that's a lot of asks in in, uh, when you have Columbus, when you have uh, Cincinnati, and when you have Cleveland. I mean, you've got Guardians, Cavs, Bengals, Reds, Crew, Blue Jackets. Those are our professional sports franchise, major league. Plus, you've got all the minor league sports franchises in Ohio. I mean, whatever would be given potentially to the Browns, certainly the Bengals are going to come back and say, hey, what about us? And so, you know, it it, it seems like it's a a really heavy lift here. And I I just don't know what the what the. What the ultimate goal is other than, you know, sure to make this happen, but I just don't, I don't know that it it seems, I'll be interested to talk to Jay Edwards and find out what the state's interest is in funding this. I mean, Brown Stadium, when was it renovated? It was not that long ago, right? Uh, No, not that long ago. Yeah, so um, this, uh, we're talking about a billion dollar renovation or a $2.4 billion dome stadium. I mean, these are huge dollar figures. And I think that there is potentially some frustration on the part of, of, of fans who say, wait a minute, I have to pay tax money for this, uh, I have to pay for the tickets, I have to pay to go uh, and eat and park and everything, or I have to pay for the NFL yeah. network package, or, you know, it, it's a lot to ask people to pay for. Who who in stu- who in uh, Control 5 sent this note? Is that you, Drew? Yeah, I figured it had to be because you would know. Um, he's with me on sort of the, the uh, very bare minimum in a stadium. He says, bring back the troughs, and anyone who's used the restroom at the old Cleveland <laughs> Municipal Stadium knows what I'm talking about, and I don't mean Ew. all the restrooms, just the men's rooms. But Ew. we'll move on from that i know listen i didn't build them uh the browns taylor are putting forth ideas uh for both staying and renovating the stadium they're in now they say it needs a big update even though as karen said it wasn't a whole long time ago that it was renovated uh and their decision will depend whether they stay there or build new in brook park on how much public support is given appears a dome stadium option is preferred though yeah it does appear that way um you know according to these reports i think what we're seeing is the more fleshed out plan is the Brook Brook Park plan. Um, you know, they've uh, talked with officials about th- proposing an entertainment district, you know, lots of bars, restaurants, um, even some condos uh, that that would be privately funded. But it, you know, th- it seems that that's sort of the proposal that they're really looking for support for. The Browns also say they really want this dome. Uh, so, uh, and, and they've come forth and said, you know, for structural and financial reasons, you know, it it's not seeming likely that they can build that in place of uh, the Brown Stadium as it is now. So, um, as as they're sort of bringing forth these proposals, you know, it, it's looking more and more like Brook Park is where they're headed. Huh. Uh, well, if they can get the money to do a 
True. You know, a $2 billion uh, project, $2.4 billion project. The dome, they would say, makes sense because it's covered and you can have more than just eight events a year. Uh, you know, if it's covered, you can have all kinds of things in there. And I mm-hmm. understand that. The other part is if you build in Brook Park, you've got an entire complex essentially owned by the team where everyone's going to eat, drink, dine, stay, mm-hmm. all of those kinds of things. So you can see the benefits of that. Again, the big question is, I think everybody's like, hey, we're all for it. The big question is going to be how much the public is going to pony up for it. And when I'm hearing from the folks who are opposed to that is how much are we going to pony up for it in a town where we've got a whole lot of things that we could use the money toward. All and kinds I'm also of wondering... Issues. I'm also wondering what the impact on downtown would be if you did pull out that economic generator in the fall. You know, I mean, Brown mm. Stadium brings in people. And I'm just wondering what the economic impact would be and then what potentially taxpayers would have to pay if that economic impact falls and, and something has to be supplemented. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, interesting that you say that. I mean, it's again, the argument is it, it brings in money, but it brings in money less than 10 times a year. On the other hand, the lakefront um, uh, development Uh, could be really special, Connor. The city is in the midst of a huge plan to redo the riverfront and the lakefront. They're planning on a lakefront with Brown Stadium, but we saw costs go way up on the planning for that, and I think part of that is because they then were saying, let's plan for it without a stadium. So it could be Cleveland with with more lakefront access to say. That could be Mm -hmm. part of the calculus, yeah. I mean, the renderings as of now show the stadium taking up, it's kind of the elephant in the room, taking up a big chunk of space there. So, and, you know, those plans include, you know, you know, like you said, expanded lake and riverfront access, you know, uh, a a walkway, you know, like land bridge rather, you know. Um, And, you know, that could be a significant, you know, you look at Chicago and the way that they've, you know, kind of approached the lakefront there. That could be a significant way to boost tourism is just a really nice lakefront access where there's lots of, you know, businesses and amenities down there. Uh, You've already got the the Rock Hall, of course, and museums and stuff like that. I also wanted to mention, too, uh, so the renovations looking up here uh, last in 2014, 2015, 120 million, and then City of Cleveland paid 30 million uh, over 15 years. So, so when you talk about 500 million, we're talking about a ton difference. more than 30 million bucks. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. So I mean, we're, and we're still paying on those last renovations too. I think here. So great uh, point. So a decade ago. Uh, it, by the way, one last point on this, this is from Ron. He says, if the Browns want the public to invest in a stadium, the Browns should negotiate an arrangement whereby the investors participate in the Browns' profits. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting All right. Point. We are going to leave that or there. Something that keeps okay. the team I'm sorry. here. That's another concern is, you know, we, we all remember what it felt like to lose the team. So something mm. that keeps the team here. Right. Right. Uh, all right, we're going to take a quick break right now. Uh, we'll obviously continue to follow both of those big stories that we topped the show off with today. When we come back, we're going to discuss a number of other stories, including the proposed doubling of a new of the per pack cigarette tax. So it's not new; it's been around for a while, but they want to double it to fund arts organizations and artists. This is the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable. I'm Mike McIntyre. Stay tuned. Welcome back to the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable from Ideastream Public Media. I'm Mike McIntyre, joined this week by Taylor Wisner and Connor Morris of Ideastream Public Media and Statehouse News Bureau Chief Karen Kassler. Before we get back to the roundtable, here's a reminder to check out this week's Ideastream News Quiz. If you're listening to the show, you are clearly tapped into the news of the week. You can find the quiz at ideastream.org slash quiz. Feel free to share your results with me at mmcintyre at ideastream.org. I have to tell you, I got them all right today, but they were hard. And some of them are things we're not talking about on the roundtable today. So listening to the news, checking out our website, listening to this show, it'll all help you. And I'm going to give you just one little freebie, and we're not having a discussion about it today, but I'll just say two words, toxic slime. Okay, that's one of, <laughs> that, that will help you with one of the questions, toxic slime. So get to uh, ideastream.org slash quiz and take that as soon as we're done with the show today. We have a little thought here before we move on about the protest, and this is from an email from uh, Kip. He says, I am in full support of the university peaceful protest of the destruction of Gaza. I am shocked how our universities, communities, and governments have come down so hard. I believe peaceful protesting makes us a better world, and when our younger generations want their voices heard, it's incredible. Let them protest. Universities, allow your students' voices to be heard. That's Kip's point of view. Moving on, the civil rights attorney who represented the family of George Floyd has taken up the case of Frank Tyson, who died during an arrest after being handcuffed by Canton police on April 18th. Police video of the incident shows an officer pinned the 53-year-old to the ground with his knee as he was handcuffed. He complained that he could not breathe. They told him he was fine. The incident unfolded inside a veterans hall after he left the scene of a nearby 
one car accident. Taylor attorney Ben Crump is representing Tyson's family now, and he claims the police did not need to put that knee on Tyson while handcuffing him. Yeah, they say, you know, use of force wasn't necessary in this case. You know, Tyson was in distress, uh, his family says, because of past experiences with police. Uh, He had been incarcerated for 24 years on a kidnapping charge. Uh, So you could imagine, you know, coming uh, into that situation with fear. And apparently he expressed uh, concerns that they were going to kill him. Uh, So he was in an agitated state likely why the police felt the need to subdue him. Uh, and repeatedly, as he was being subdued, he said, I could, I can't breathe. I can't breathe. You know, calling back to the George Floyd uh, incident. So, you know, one police officer, uh, we, as we've seen in the video, has even responded, uh, you know, callously saying, you know, shut the expletive up. So, you know, th- the video release of that incident has really called into question of how uh, police officers should be responding to incidents like this. Crump says, how many times will it take for police to listen? How long until they start practicing de-escalation practices? He's also calling for the Department of Justice to investigate now. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So uh, him, as well as the Stark County and uh, AACP, have requested the DOJ open an investigation into Tyson's death. Right now, the incident is being investigated by the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation. Uh, They're just in the beginning stages, of course. Officers are on leave and um, the autopsy is in process. They say it could take a minimum of five weeks to be released, according to the coroner's office. Canton has a new mayor, and reforming the relationship between the community and police was an issue in the campaign. This uh, obviously is another issue to deal with. Yeah, yeah. You know, Mayor um, Shearer has had to balance uh, this issue throughout his campaign of police shortages, rising crime trends, and just community concerns about racial discrimination after the fatal police shooting of James Williams in 2022. If you remember, uh, an officer shot Williams through the fence of his home, Williams' home. Uh, You know, sure, told Idea Stream Public Media he wants to work with Police Chief John Gabbard to build back that trust with the public and the police department. But he also wants the police to improve their training practices. So uh, he's very much paying attention to this issue. He sat down with Tyson's family to give them all the information before the public and to share his condolences and he's promised transparency to the community throughout this whole process you mentioned the i can't breathe it was mm. uh, and, and as you mentioned george floyd also eric garner using those words in 2014 when he died uh, mm. during an arrest by new york police so mm-hmm. uh, clearly those words are are echoing with uh, with ben crump and we will continue to cover that as well Let's move on to Akron. Residents have expressed concerns about Akron police during community forums in the wake of a police shooting of an Akron man, a teen, actually, who was carrying a replica gun. The teen survived. He was shot in the hand. The officer is on paid administrative leave. One city council member describes the situation as a stalemate with the community, wants police to work on its relationship with community members. Council member James Hardy Taylor says he won't vote for a new police headquarters unless there's some improvement in that relationship. Yeah, he says relations between Akron police and the public are desperately need to improve, you know, indicating that sort of the police aren't doing enough to respond to the community's questions. Uh, In the month since the shooting, community members have continued to share concerns about the police at community forums and meet in council meetings. Meanwhile, Akron police... Akron Police's union has repeatedly defended this officer who shot the teen. Uh, you know, they've come forward several times, uh, you know, and and Hardy says, you know, this this has really reached this, as you said, a stalemate. He wants the council to get involved in improving the relations between the police and the community. And he's actually planning to brainstorm some ideas with another city council member on how to do that. All right, let's talk about Cuyahoga County and funding for the arts right now. The nonprofit group Cuyahoga Arts and Culture, which distributes money from a cigarette tax to fund the arts, is moving toward increasing the tax from 30 cents a pack to more than double, 70 cents. Smoking has gone down, which is good for health and bad for funding. IdeaStream, by the way, which covers the arts, is one of the recipients of the funding. Mm -hmm. Taylor, that's a hefty increase. How did Cuyahoga Arts and Culture arrive at that number? 
Yeah, it's been a long time coming. Uh, I mean, the CAC's revenue has been off by 24% just this year, but it's been a trend for a while now. The original amount for this tax was decided something like 15 years ago. So, you know, over time, as we've seen population trends here in Northeast Ohio have gone down. uh, So there's fewer people paying that tax and fewer people who are smoking. Uh, So good. (laughs) Good, good, right? I mean, I think uh, it's sort of a penalty tax in a way uh, to help support the arts, but maybe discourage people from smoking. So uh, we're sort of winning in one respect and losing in the other. Um, So the board has considered maybe taxing other products as a way to figure out how to restore funding. But ultimately, they've decided, you know, they don't want to tax vape products or movie rentals or alcohol. And uh, so those ideas haven't really made it before the public, and and they're just going to increase the tax. Uh, is their proposal on uh, cigarettes? They're proposing it, so the county council has to say, okay, let's put it on a ballot. But it's going to be a vote. Cuyahoga County would have to vote on this, right? I so mean, the people of Cuyahoga County. Yeah. So it's to the city council or the county council at this point um, to place it before the public on the ballot. I think it's the ballot November 2024. So yes, obviously this will go to voters before this is approved. All right. Let's go back to Columbus. Senator Bill Blessing, a Cincinnati area Republican lawmaker, has proposed raising Ohio's minimum wage to $15 by January 1st, 2028. Now that comes as advocates seek to get a $15 minimum wage measure on the November ballot this year, which will be enacted much sooner if approved. So Karen, it appears to be an effort to get something done before the voters can vote on this. So it's not, I don't know, Is it? does he want a higher minimum wage or is it just a way for the state to take control of this and not have the voters uh, make their voice heard? Well, I think lawmakers do feel like they may have learned something from the casino votes over the years that uh, when when finally people approved casinos, then state lawmakers didn't have the ability to put regulations on the casinos because they were constitutional amendments. So this may be an attempt. And really going back to like the 90s, when you put minimum wage votes to voters, uh, minimum wage increases to voters, they approve them. And so it, it seems likely that if this does make the ballot that it will get approved. So maybe this is, I, I think it's almost certainly an attempt to try to take control of this issue, but it could still go to the ballot anyway. It's interesting because at uh, the polling place for the primary this year, where I was, there was someone circulating a petition for this minimum oh, yeah. wage. It's a and great place to circulate petitions because you know you're getting registered voters. <laughs> exactly yes. right. Smart people. Yeah. But he was approached by someone who identified himself as a small business owner who just gave him a real piece of his mind and said, you have no idea how this is going to damage things and people are going to have fewer jobs. So while it may be something that's popular at the polls, it is still something that is quite the subject of debate. Right. And that's one thing that we might be able to see if indeed it does go to a constitutional Constitutional amendment. We could potentially see a real debate on what has been the history of when you raise minimum wage, what happens to businesses, especially small businesses. Uh, the state right now, uh, when you start talking about home rule and local control, you know, the, the cities cannot raise minimum wage like they would want to because the state has that control there. And so this could be a really interesting opportunity to talk about what minimum wage can do and what it does do and what it what the negative effects are and the difference of cost of living between living in a city versus living in a different area the key difference on this bill and uh, and what would happen with the voter approved bill should that happen is that wages for non tipped workers uh, would only be raised in the bill. Those who get tips would remain at seven fifty an hour. The legislation would make them higher. So there are some differences too. Yeah, and right now the current minimum wage is ten dollars and forty five cents an hour. That's for non tipped employees. Five twenty five an hour for tipped employees. Now all of this goes back to a two thousand six constitutional amendment on minimum wage, which voters approved that raises it because of inflation, the state minimum wage. This, of course, would raise it to a dollar figure of $15, and uh, I think it goes higher after that. I'd have to look at it again. But, you know, again, this discussion of that minimum wage isn't enough to be a living wage in, in most parts of the country, and therefore what can... What can be done about that? And and what is 
a minimum wage job intended to be. You hear a lot of conversations about how, well, that's a starting point. But other people, it is a career. This is what they're doing. And these are necessary jobs. So all of this comes into play. Yeah, I hear concerns from those opposed to it that it isn't just a minimum wage increase. If you increase the bottom, then you've got to increase the intermediate and the higher. So it's basically a wage increase across the board. And is that sustainable? It'll be a great discussion, and I know you'll be on it. Absolutely. Uh, Let's talk more education. And it's interesting, Connor, because we had an email from Barbara who said, perhaps not as exciting as campus protests, but there are big shakeups happening in your backyard. CSU is shutting down more than 20 degree programs. Notre Dame College closed this week. Uh, Baldwin Wallace University has some changes. She says, what's happening and why the public deserves to know? Great question at a perfect time. Yeah. Because that's the next (laughs) thing on our agenda. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Connor (laughs) has actually covered all of those uh, issues. And yes, uh, let's start with the Baldwin Wallace, the president there, Bob Helmer, announced this week he'll retire at the end of June. He made the announcement to students and staff in a letter. And right now, the school is dealing with a huge deficit and a number of cuts. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it was kind of a surprise. I mean, he'd been there for 12 years. Um, you know, at the same time, if things are really turning south for the college, it's kind of not that uncommon to see administrators uh, jumping ship, so to speak. Um, right. I remember Mike Persimone uh, had left Notre Dame College yes. and it, a year later or so was when they've decided they're closing. And in fact, it did close its doors. Yeah. Among other administrators as well, too, over there before that happened. Yeah. I mean, yeah, for background, I mean, Bolden Wallace announced cuts to 23 staff positions in February. A lot of other cost cutting measures to combining degree programs, uh, shuttering others that were kind of low enrolled. Um, you know, they say they're, they're facing a, a pretty significant budget deficit. Um, it's caused by enrollment issues, rising costs. Uh, although they had a, a pretty significant um, uh, f- class uh, of enrollment uh, just this last year. So things aren't really that bad necessarily on the enrollment front for the college. So there could be some other factors at play there as well. Notre Dame College didn't make it. South Euclid, it's now permanently closed. There was some hope by some board members that perhaps they could persuade the university to let it come in and help restructure debt. Not going to happen. Uh The college announced in February it was going to close after this semester. Notre Dame College was founded in 1922, and yesterday was a milestone with it being closed. Yeah, and the question there is what's going to happen with the building, and we're really not sure yet. One thing that I'd like to dig into in the next, you know, couple weeks is, is, you know, who is involved with the, what happens to the building now? Is there a trusteeship? Are the board of trustees still involved? Uh, It's an open question right now, I think. We're talking about that. We've talked about students because they're, getting into a bunch of other schools that agreed to take them and let them move on their uh, degree track. What about faculty and staff? What happens to them? That's something that I also like to to really, if if you're listening right now, I'd love to hear from you. (laughs) You know, uh, it's, it's, with the students, you know, it's probably going to be a boon to those colleges that they're going to. Uh, and that's something that we might be seeing is actually with these cons- this consolidation, uh, some colleges might, you know, see their enrollment increase because these students are going there. Now, with the faculty and staff, I don't know if that's going to be happening by the same token. Uh, these schools and universities are trying to keep their costs down. So it's not likely that they're going to be really trying to hire up all these these faculty and staff that are left uh, kind of out in the wind uh, after a college closes, unfortunately. Great idea for a story. So let's talk to some faculty and staff at Notre Dame College now that school is over. You can get in touch with Connor at cmorris at ideastream.org, C-M-O-R-R-I-S at ideastream.org. And we're going to take a quick break right now because we need to do that. We've got a bunch of other stuff to get to before we end the program, including a look at just how much litter is left along our state highways and roads and how much that's costing you. It's a Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable. I'm Mike McIntyre. Be back soon. You're back with the Sound of Ideas Reporters Roundtable from Ideastream Public Media. It's me, Mike McIntyre, along with Karen Kassler, Taylor Wisner, and Connor Morris. The battle over leadership of the Ohio House Republican Caucus appears nowhere close to ending. This week, House Speaker Jason Stevens removed six fellow Republicans from committees that they chaired. All six had voted for his rival, Derek Marin, for House Speaker. You'll recall Stevens ended up with the gavel by winning over about a third of the House Republicans and then all of the House Democrats. Some of his support was er eroded in this year's Republican primary. Karen, some are questioning whether 
what Stevens did is legal in terms of removing these folks. Yeah, one of the six committee chairs, Phil Plummer, who's the former Montgomery County Sheriff, says he's looking into filing an ethics complaint or a, even opening a criminal investigation into whether what Jason Stevens did is legal. Now, House speakers can remove committee chairs from committees. They do it all the time. And But what Plummer and these other committee chairs say he did this time is he tied their committee chairmanship and the removal of it to their donations to challengers in the Republican primary, challengers who were going after incumbent Republicans who had supported Stevens. And so they say that that's inappropriate use of politics, it obstructs public policy, but Stevens has said, hey, I want unity in the caucus. These people, by donating to opponents, show disunity, and that's what happened. I mean, can you understand why people get disgusted with politics? This is this is very it's a lot of soap opera kind of feeling I think for a lot of people, but this is all politics. This is how it works and it can be very frustrating, it can be very back and forth, and it really shows you why the legislature has done so little in terms of passing actual bills this year. Some people will say, "Hey, that's a good thing. We don't want the legislature doing a lot of work." But when you elect people to the legislature and really a lot of issues don't get pushed forward, this is this can be one of the reasons that people can point to and say, this is why. And this really sets up um, a continuing battle. This one won't involve Derek Maron. It'll involve instead the current Senate president possibly going for Jason Stevens' job. Yeah, Derek Maron was term limited. And certainly there were folks who would look at that and say, well, wasn't that by design? He could be term limited, spend two years, and then Senate President Matt Huffman, who's running unopposed to the House, could come over to the House and then become Speaker. But of course, Jason Stevens is already Speaker, and so he's going to challenge that. And he's not term limited. He is not term limited. And it should be mentioned here that Republicans have a supermajority in both the House and the Senate. And sometimes when one party controls with that kind of supermajority, these kinds of things can happen. All right. Well, uh, more politics for you to cover. It's not all budgets for you. No, no, not at all. All right. Thud, that sound on the roadway is unsettling. You hit a squirrel or a raccoon, but even worse, a cat or a dog, a beloved family pet. Will the owner ever know what happened to their furry family member? An Ohio bill seeks to make that possible by requiring that crews scan the deceased animal for an implanted pet identification chip, which many pets have now. It's called Lassie's Law, sponsored by State Representative Sarah Carruthers from Butler County. And Karen, I was thinking about this. If Coco or Otis ever uh, escaped and I never heard again what might have happened, and if this kind of tragedy happened, you'd certainly want to know. Absolutely. And that's the whole point. I talked to Representative Carruthers for our TV show, The State of Ohio, this week about that bill and a couple other animal related bills that she has. And one of the things that she said is even this bill that would allow for the micro scan or the microchip scanning and for for people to be notified. She doesn't think that there necessarily is the support to pass it right now. She's the only Republican who has signed on to this bill. She's hoping to get more support. But these animal bills often get proposed and they do don't move for a reason that is kind of still escapes me here. I, I think that they just get uh, lost in the priorities there. Uh, interesting that uh, that that's the case, that it isn't something that's high on the priority list. I also wonder, how would this work? So if they scan uh, a pet and they find out that it's your pet, do you then get a call? Do you recover yes. the, the body or the carcass? Yeah, the, the, she told me that there's a scanner they, that they would be equipped with. It's a very uh, inexpensive scanner. They can scan it, and then if they find that the pet is microchipped, they can take the pet to a facility where it can be kept for 24 hours while they notify the pet's owners, and then the pet's owners can decide whether they want to collect the pet or whether they want the uh, road crew or whoever to dispose of it. Connor, I know you are a really loving cat dad. Um, I, I would, Who isn't? Uh, cats are awesome. Okay, well, I'm not, uh, I'm, but I'm a loving dog dad, and I okay. love people who love cats, too. Uh, well, you mentioned Coco. I had a cat named oh. You mentioned Coco. I had a cat named Coco uh, growing up, too, so you really you plugged my heartstrings a little bit there. Uh, R.I.P. Coco. He's a good cat. Yeah, mm-hmm. so, so having such a, a thing like this would probably 
for you be helpful? Uh, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something controversial. Okay. I actually don't think people should let their cats outside at all. Okay, uh, actually, research 100% shows that. One hundred percent agree. What, but 100% however, agree. however, can I just say that we are all fallible, and sometimes you open a door and a cat. Oh, can't absolutely, get out, yeah, right? and, and a lot of folks, yeah, do have their cats microchip. My cat doesn't really like. I'll like show her the door, and she'll like walk outside for a second and be like, okay. Whatever you know, right. walks back in. So I don't have her microchip. Probably, probably should. Actually, Your cat but. knows where the food yeah, is. Yeah, she, she knows. It's, it's too nice inside. <laughs> Not it? leaving sugar daddy. Yeah. <laughs> All it's right. It's true though. Animal owners live in fear of the dog running away. Yeah. You know, yeah. so yeah. it just does bring peace of mind knowing that. You know, you you could find your dog more easily. For Listen, your cat. <laughs> I don't I don't want to make this sound like a country music song, but yeah. when I was a kid, our dog Mac, uh, a mutt, did get out, and yeah. exactly that way, an opening side door was hit by a train in Lakewood, oh, and yeah, it was yeah, that was a pretty devastating time as a kid. But again, not related to this type of thing. We did, <laughs> by the way, find him and and um, uh, and a real tragedy. But I'm I'm just saying, I'm with all you pet owners out there. We'll see what this legislation does. Let's talk about uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion. The mayor of Brooklyn has vetoed the. Cre- creation of an inclusion and belonging commission. Brooklyn City Council approved the creation of this commission by a vote of four to two, but Mayor Ron Kirk said no. And Connor, why? Yeah, the mayor is echoing some, there's arguments against uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion that are kind of increasingly becoming more common in the country nowadays. And folks are saying that it's kind of giving merit or giving benefit to folks who might not necessarily uh, deserve it just based off of their race or the, their class, you know, a kind of social class. Uh, and so he, he was saying that, you know, uh, he had a quote that was interesting in, in Cleveland.com. He said, I find it very interesting that DEI was pushed very heavily on college campuses and those same college campuses are having anti-Semitic rallies. Hmm. Uh, and students on those campuses would argue that they're not anti-Semitic. They would argue that they're criticizing the state of Israel. And, and, and so would the protesters who are Jewish as part of that group. Yeah, as well, too. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, he, he's saying that it's just too polarizing, doesn't need to be there in the city. And the uh, the, the council members say, well, we, we just want to listen to people and we want to make sure that this is an angle that we consider when we're considering legislation. So. So. Mayor, Mayor also said that he had issues with who might be on the commission. Yeah, he said that uh, there was a, a kind of a part of the uh, resolution that uh, would allow non-residents to be on the commission as well. And so that was a concern, too. All right. We only cover the um, most important breaking news here, the, the <laughs> stuff that's really crucial for you to know. So here's another one. Akron Mayor Shamus Malik has a biz- busy agenda in his first year in office. And now that includes getting married. Malik proposed to his girlfriend in Paris while on vacation last weekend, according to the city's social media accounts. Uh, I thought it was kind of neat they put it up on social media, but as you would expect, the news for Malik was met with enthusiasm, Taylor. Yes, it was. We heard from Mayor Justin Bibb. Uh, he shared uh, his congratulations uh, to Mayor um, Malik. You know, it just, oh, can, you talk about the pictures being so great. A boat on the Seine with the Eiffel Tower in the background. I don't know how you get a more picture perfect. Well, well wait a minute. <laughs> Image. Uh, I pulled a um, I pulled a picnic table to the lakeside at Lakewood Park, <laughs> and Aww. then it and then it rained. So I got <laughs> I I got engaged on a blanket in my wife's apartment. Uh, my at the time my girlfriend's apartment in Lakewood. So Aww. close enough, right? The yeah. pictures weren't quite as good though. <laughs> yeah. Also, they were taken with one of those cameras where you get two prints developed, and they're really dark. And <laughs> did you have somebody taking the photos for you? No. It was uh, the, the original selfie. Oh, uh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> I was taking pictures just of her saying, look, it's really true. I have a girlfriend. <laughs> yeah, uh, I'm of the opinion that it's it's the thought around the proposal that counts, yeah. not, not, you know, how outlandish it is. I, I entirely agree with that. <laughs> All right. Did you ever see someone toss a pop can, a cheeseburger wrapper, or a cigarette butt out the window as they're driving down the highway or roadway, and then you have to suppress your rage? Litter bugs are the worst, and what they do doesn't just make you angry and degrade the environment. It costs you money. The Ohio Department of Transportation says so far it has bagged nearly 90000 bags of trash this year at a cost to you of $10 million a year. So, Connor, is it really so hard not to litter as no, you're driving it, down it the highway? No, it makes you want to... Uh Kind of act like uh, Frank Reynolds, uh, you know, uh, Danny DeVito's character in Always Sunny. He's the trash man. I come out <laughs> into the arena and I throw trash everywhere. <laughs> and I eat garbage. 
I think it was Kramer in uh, Seinfeld who uh, who was cleaning up highway litter as well. Yeah. The whole other story on that. So clearly that's part of the zeitgeist. Yeah. But um, but the idea, uh, Taylor, it just kind of shocked me that the amount of money that it costs ODOT. And you would think they've got to have crews out there. You're picking up gum wrappers. I mean, it's not just the big stuff. It's the little stuff that accumulates. And if you drive down a highway and see all that detritus along the side of it, you realize what a bad look it is. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I've been noticing just clean cleanup efforts in general sort of along along the highway, although I, I actually have a bone to pick <laughs> with ODOT on this because they've cut down some trees that were blocking some highway noise in my neighborhood uh, and are, is kind of created an eyesore. Um, so uh, with, with more trash actually being visible. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it, you know, there's always... Uh, it always can be improved, but um, yeah, quite yeah. a quite a cost. Don't don't they know who you are? <laughs> don't they know not to do it in my neighborhood? Yeah. Karen, I know the Columbus area is pristine. There's never oh, trash. yeah, never, never see anything uh, weird or God, I don't want to touch that. You know. <laughs> well, guys, great conversation today.